friends, colleagues, loved ones. We're here today to lay to rest a good friend. Somebody who's been with us for many years, somebody that I know many of you, like me, have been very close to for probably 15 years, really. Um, good old instructional design has been part of my life. But we're here today to say our final farewell. And as sad as that may seem, before instructional design passed, he had a daughter. That daughter we are calling learning experience design. Now, she's got a great life ahead of her, but at the moment, she's not really quite sure what she should do. So we are greatly privileged and really lucky to have three fantastic speakers here with us today from different fields that can influence and shape the life of our new young learning experience design. We have Laura Kalbag, who is an expert in human-centered design. Uh, we have Pete Jenkins, who is an expert in gamification. And we have Julian Stodd, who specializes in social scaffolded learning. Uh, all of whom we will hear from today. So the structure that we will follow to do that, um, we've got this little uh, introduction now, um, and then each of the speakers has just 10 minutes, just 10 minutes to give us the core principles that underpin the work that they do in their different fields. Now our jobs as a group, now I know it's the end of the conference and I know it could be a sad occasion, you know, it's a, it's a funeral and all, but I want you to talk to one another. I want you to listen first of all and then we're gonna get you to talk to the people around you and think about from what you've just learned from the speakers, what can you take, what can you use, what can you learn from that, and what can you apply in your role of learning experience design. So you can also uh, tweet your ideas if, uh, if you choose. Uh, we're using our hashtag uh, IdeasDead, and we'll try and have a tweet wall up, uh, but also we'll go in with a microphone and we'll, we'll capture those great ideas from you. Um, we'll cycle through that three times, one for each of the speakers. And at the end, we have time for questions. I'm sure you'll, you'll have some uh, to all of the speakers. Uh, and then a final wrap up uh, at the end, closing off this, uh, this sad but also joyous, joyous occasion. So before we do that, I'd like to gauge how you feel, the, the emotion in the room, these emotional occasions, funerals always. So with the passing of instructional design, if you feel like this, could you put your hand up? You're kind of alarmed, are you, are you frightened by it? Are you uncertain about the future? No. It's a very positive group. We've got one, we've got one gentleman there. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> Any, anybody else want to, want to join Ed? It's just Ed. Well, Ed, Ed, we're here for you, man. We are here for you. <laughs> now, who is instead feeling like this? <laughs> about this exciting new beginning. So hands up, people that are feeling this is a great beginning, it's a new start. We celebrate the life instructional design, we move forward with learning experience design. Fantastic, thank you everybody. So, uh, without further ado, I will hand over to our, our first speaker, uh, Laura. Experience design is very straightforward. This is a lift. I think we're all very familiar with lifts. This is often the kind of experience you get when you come into a lift. Buttons all over the place. No idea where you're going, what you're doing. And you know you've got to get to one of those floors. Whether you can find it very easily is a completely different matter. Sometimes we get into a lift and it's got this kind of reverse thing going on. Are we going up or are we going down? It's very hard to tell. Sometimes there's only one button needed, but it needs relabeling because that button doesn't really work very well and people keep hitting the emergency button by accident because that looks more lifty. Sometimes we have buttons that look like buttons and labels that look like buttons. So we're not entirely sure which ones we're supposed to be pressing. <laughs> Sometimes we have calculator lifts, and these are very popular. 
I mean, I'm not really sure what I get if I uh, add floor one to floor two, what the result would be, or, or if I decide to go to floor 6.5 instead. The calculator, uh, let's continue. This one, there's no equal, so I'm not sure how you would get to uh, the sum of what you're going for, but very peculiar. There are door buttons where you can open the doors and close the doors, and open the doors harder and close the doors harder. <laughs> There are arrangements that look very beautiful. Whether they're practical is a completely different matter. Whether they have any relevance to the layout of the building is unclear. And sometimes you have all of these buttons that are, relate to floors, except the first floor appears to be the alarm button. <laughs> and I wonder how many times people press that one when they intend to go to reception. This is probably one of the cleanest layouts of uh, lift buttons I could find, uh, despite the slightly amusing appearance. <laughs> it does actually lay out to the kind of floors that you would get in a building. You can see which is basement. You can see it goes up. It's sensible. The two different types of buttons, the floor buttons and the door buttons, are very clearly separated out from each other. There's plenty of white space around them. And actually, when you come down to looking at the door buttons closer, they're even slightly color coded. So you can see the yellow warning, this will close the doors, someone might get shut in them, and green, this is what you want if you want to get out. This is designing for purpose. And so when we talk about UX, or um, we talk about user experience design, the irony being that making it UX rather than UE is that it's not terribly great experience. This is because we're thinking, when we're designing entirely about the user, what they need and what they want to get out of the interaction. However, the only other industries that refer to users as the people who uh, make use of their product are the drug industry. Is this because we have something in common with them? Are we trying to get people addicted? to what we're giving them. We don't want to be creating addictive design. We don't want to trick people into using what we're building. We want to design things that provide real value, that actually provide benefit to the people that are using them. So that's why I like to call it experience design. It's much shorter anyway. This is the kind of design that empowers individuals that gives people the ability to do something that they want to do that they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. It's actually very important that we design for ourselves first in these situations. When we design for another person, we are making assumptions about what that other person wants and what they could get out of it. That's why a lot of really great products are actually created out of pe for people who had a problem and tried to design something to fix that problem that had that pain point and tried to solve it. When we design for ourselves first, we know exactly what we need. We are not making assumptions about another person. However, we are not the same as everybody else. We can only design very well for ourselves and for people like us. So what if you have a wider audience? What if you're trying to build for a greater group of people? Well, that's why we need diverse organizations, because diverse organizations create products for diverse audiences. When it comes to experience design, our existing business goals don't matter. We can't focus on what we did have. We can't focus on things that will make other people, stakeholders, happy. Because that's not focusing on the individual. Providing a great experience to people is a differentiating factor. We don't need to worry about how we're going to compete with another way of doing things, because by providing a great experience, people will want to use our things anyway. So this is uh, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. You've probably seen it a million times over, so I'm just going to run through very quickly. Our physiological needs are the first things we need to address as humans. This is eating and sleeping and things like that. We can't really think about much else unless we're getting enough food, sleep, water, things like that. Once we've addressed those needs, we can focus on safety, being safe, feeling safe, being in an environment where we know we're not going to be eaten by something else. 
Then we can focus on love and belonging, creating meaningful relationships with each other. And then once we've got that, we can look at um, having esteem and having a, a feeling of our position in society. And then self-actualization, knowing what we want to actually do with ourselves. Like this, a great experience cannot stand alone. We need to build a great experience on a foundation of respecting the people that we're building things for. And so the organization that I work with, Indy, we have um, our own kind of triangle. We want to build things with a basis that are private, secure, accessible, and sustainable. And I'll explain a little bit more about those later. But these are principles that essentially respect our human rights. If a product is inaccessible, if certain people can't use it, for example, if people with a particular disability can't use something, it can't be a great experience for all. When we build things to tailor to work for people with particular needs, we tend to make things that benefit everybody. If a product isn't sustainable, if it isn't financially well supported, if we don't think it's going to last forever, if it's a sort of here today, gone tomorrow thing, what's the point in someone putting their time and effort into using it? It's not worth their effort. So creating products that are functional, convenient, and reliable, this is the base level we tend to go for nowadays, respects human effort. And then we can layer delight on top. We can make something a really great experience because this respects our human experience. And we call this the three R's of ethical design. That is how we make great experiences. Thank you. OK, so uh, what we'd like you to do now is taking on board what Laura shared with us in those brief 10 minutes, I'd like you to talk to the people around you and think about and discuss and decide from what Laura's shared, what can you take and what can you apply to your work? So we're gonna give you about three minutes to do that and then we're gonna get you to share some with us using the roving mic. So off you go. Okay everybody, time's up. Sorry, that went really quickly. I'm gonna grab a roving mic. And um, so who's got something great to share with the group? Or shall I just pick on somebody? <laughs> Uh, so any, anybody come up with a great way they can take some of what Laura has shared um, on uh, experience design and apply that to their work. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, John and I work in the same company so we could specifically look at an example that we worked on last year. We, we ran a, a series of web webinars. Uh, we've got a very large international audience in about 24 countries. Um, the webinars were quite straightforward. We, we recorded three videos um, with subject matter experts in those areas. And then we delivered them um, to those countries in a way that we sort of established whether they could s listen to their content and hear the content. And then we um, gave them different channels in which they could give us feedback, like questions, before, before we actually ran the, the WebEx. And then during the WebEx, we had a Q&A uh -huh. session. So people could actually articulate their questions or they could send a text or a chat. So again, we're looking at different uh, ways in which they, their preferred ways of actually interacting with us. Oh. And that seemed to work quite well. So yeah. I think some of those layers that you had probably were met. Very good, thank you. Anybody else like to share something? Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, I work for a global market research company and we have our user experience group that we just bought a couple years ago and we're rolling out a learning management system. So the blindingly obvious thing to do would have them look at that yeah. before we roll it out Super. to make sure that we don't do things that you know, yeah. are stupid. Very good. <laughs> I'm starting to see this happen, that um, large corporates are starting to get UX teams, which I think is absolutely awesome, and use them as a lens to look at technology choices, uh, you know, internal processes, pretty much everything that touches a human will benefit from good design. So. Exactly, very good. Uh, any more points before we move on to the next presentation? No? Okay, brilliant. Ooh -ah. Stay on. It's nearly my funeral. <laughs> it's all carefully planned. 
Uh, not sure one, isn't it? Okay, go again. So I'm very quickly going to tell you how gamification works, okay? And for me, the power of gamification is about how it makes people feel, how fun makes people feel, okay? People playing games are obviously having fun, and they're highly motivated. And gamification is about learning what works really well in those games and using that knowledge in other situations. My favorite definition, the top one is the, the accepted definition. My favorite definition is from the same person, Kevin Wehrbach. It's the process of making activities more game-like. It's a very doing definition. It's very active. And that's what playing games is all about as well. So what is a game? Bernard Suits uh, defines games as giving us unnecessary obstacles that we volunteer to tackle. And author and games researcher Jamie McGonagall gives the example of golf. If we really want to efficiently get the balls into the holes, we'd pick the balls up, walk over, and put them in the holes. But instead, we put the hole a really long way away and then decide to hit the ball with just a small stick-like object. With obstacles. Similarly, Rafe Costa, author of A Theory of Fun, he de um, defines game design as about giving problems to a user rather than removing problems from the user. Okay, so we're going for, from the opposite approach to the previous speaker, really. Okay, and it might seem counterintuitive to add problems to what your to your work processes. But actually, adding them makes them more fun and more engaging, and actually the job still gets done, and maybe even more so. Now, the knowledge and learning we've gathered from research and games matches up quite nicely with scientific theories from the realms of neuroscience, psychology, and behavioral economics that already exist. So I'm going to quickly take you through um, the why and how the gamification works. And this will help you understand the key tools we want to work with to achieve the best motivational and behavioral effects. I'm going to start from the neuroscience, okay, that actually underlies it all. Um, there are four key groups of neurotransmitters that we get focus on in gamification. Okay, and dopamine is really important because it's released before you do something. It, uh, it rewards you for what you're about to do. So it's the most important neurotransmitter in terms of getting you to do something, okay? Um, so it drives us to act. And uh, a key way to trigger dopamine is to offer something new and unexpected. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to participate in a fun little exercise. There, hopefully that's just released a little bit of anticipation and dopamine. <laughs> that was good. It's as easy as that. Now, oxytocin, that's key to how we bond to others, okay? So... Um, Bonding between lovers, between mothers and daughters, in groups and friendships. And one way to release oxytocin is through touch. So, and now for a little exercise, I'd like to shake hands with the person on either side of you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's good. That's good. Now, oxytocin gives us a strong feeling of contentment, okay, uh, particularly in social situations like this. However, it strengthens all social feelings. So best not to touch someone when they're angry, as you'll make them angrier. Okay, so I hope you checked first. Yeah, or if they're in a state of dislike, they'll dislike you more. That's not good. Really recently, there's research that shows that oxytocin can now be released um, remotely. So there's research showing that Twitter interactions are helping people release oxytocin. So that's social network. Even though we haven't evolved, evolved for that, actually still has that effect of releasing oxytocin. Serotonin is a mood regulator. If you have enough of it, you'll be happy. If you don't have enough, you'll be unhappy. And we can trigger it by making you feel wanted, important, and proud. So when you're being thanked for something, that's pretty good. Or when you've achieved something that required a lot of effort. Yeah? Lots of game mechanics can be used to utilize serotonin. Endorphins are opioids that we naturally produce as a reaction to certain stimuli. Okay. When they're released, we feel good, possibly even high or euphoric. Okay. And they also reduce uh, fatigue in response to stress. They're what give us our second wind. Now, overcoming the challenges in games is often what can stimulate the release of endorphins. I'm not going to cover it in detail, because Laura kindly did. But a good place to move from the neuroscience to the psychology is through Maslow's hierarchy of needs from, the, from 1943. Um, and what we really talk about here is that we really need the basics to be in place at the bottom of the pyramid 
in order for any gamification to work. So in the corporate world, we often talk about it being a good idea to say we assume that staff are being paid enough to feel secure and safe for any gamification to then actually work at its best. The key theory underpinning the rest of it is self-determination theory. Okay, and um, key to self-determination theory is the difference between autonomous motivation and controlled motivation. So autonomy involves doing things with a sense of volition and having the experience of choice. So intrinsic motivation tends to be an autonomous motivation. Whereas in contrast, being controlled involves acting with a sense of pressure, uh, a sense of having to engage in the actions. So quite often what we experience at work. Daniel Pink, author of Drive, looked at these motivations in terms of work. And he's got three key drivers, mastery, purpose, and autonomy. And here, um, competence on the previous one, which was really about feeling secure enough to have a go at something, has moved to mastery, which is more about aiming to have better skills and to get really good at something. And he's added purpose, which is generally around things, well, it could be really big things, like helping try and save the world, that sort of thing. And purpose is used a lot in games through storytelling and epic themes. Now we get to Andrzej Marzuski, who's a gamification guru, and he has a really neat way of showing us how to apply all these theories to gamification. So in his three layers of motivation, we can see in the core layer, we've got everything from Maslow's hierarchy of needs that we really need to have in place. And then in the emotional level, he's combined self-determination theory and drive to give us ramp or relatedness, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And that's actually where we spend most time, if possible, in gamification. Yeah? That's the really important bit. And only then do we move to the trivial layer, which is really what you might expect to see in gamification. The badges, the points, the bonuses, that sort of thing. If I had longer at this point, I'd also talk about understanding the demographics and which game elements to use to motivate different types of people. Um, I recommend you have a look at Andrzej Marzuski's uh, Player Types Hexad or you guide Charles Octalysis framework to learn a bit more about that. Here we have some of the core concepts and emotional motivators that uh, we're using to get, achieve those different theories in gamification. I like the example of failing off this list. As a feedback mechanism in gameplay, the power of providing a safe place to fail, I think really shouldn't be underestimated as a way of creating super learning. Yeah. Um, actually, I wanted you to spend 15 to 20 seconds thinking about each of these and how they relate back to the neurotransmitters we were looking at earlier, because each one, you can kind of see which neurotransmitter they relate to. Now, here are some of the commonly used game components. These are what you probably expect to see in gamification. Okay, and actually we can see where some of these really relate to what we've been looking at. Gifting really works for relatedness. Quests relate to purpose and mastery, and sorry, purpose and meaning. Boss fights to competence and mastery. Uh, autonomy can be something as simple as choosing and customizing um, avatars. I find collections quite interesting. Most people collect, and if they're not collecting something, they just haven't found what they want to collect yet. Yeah? Um, I came across someone in one of my talks who collects VW vans. That's a collection that takes up a lot of space. Um, do any of you have, or know someone who has, let's make it safe, a nice example of a really interesting collection? Someone does. It doesn't have to be as good as the VW vans. Nails. Nails? <laughs> What a great question, that hasn't even occurred to me. And then he's here at the funeral. Uh, okay, go on. Hats. Hats. You, how many? About 400. That's the person who knows how to collect. Yeah. And oh, out of interest, have you got a target you want to reach, or is it going to be a never ending quest? Yeah. A true collection doesn't have an ending either. They're the best ones. Cool. Okay. So how do we put all that together? There's a quite a few different design frameworks that work for gamification. I really like Kevin Weirbach's gamification design framework. It's pretty simple, so it's quite an easy one to get started with. Always start with defining the business objectives. Seems like a no-brainer. Then look at what behaviors or actions you need 
um, to encourage or discourage in your staff to achieve those objectives. Then look at what motivates your players or users or trainers or um, learners, whatever it might be. And only then can you really look at the activity loops, which is the game mechanics and stuff, and try and put them together to create the activities that get to those business objectives. By this point, it's got a bit technical. It's worth doing a bit of play testing. Definitely do some play testing. Make sure it's still fun. And then you look at the practicalities of how best to get it in front of them, what sort of system and platform to use. Now, it doesn't have to be a huge project or a piece of work. You could start by looking at a simple process or product and working out how to improve it. As an example, I wanted to improve the effectiveness of my business card. That's my little thing. And so on the back, I've added a collection of things to do for people. Yeah? So there's a collection. It's challenges of different difficulty. Oh, it's already started. You're on the journey. Yeah? That's great. In fact, also, it does two other little things I really like. It shows you that it doesn't have to be digital gamification. And also, it doesn't have to look like a game. Yeah? Because we're actually doing, we're learning from games. We're not actually necessarily building games. So it's actually, to do something like this is a really good intro to it into an organization. Yeah? Because then you can get a bit more buy-in more easily. Instead of people thinking they're going to be wasting their time playing games. So finally, I'd just like you to think about what emotions you're going to make your learners feel from now on in order to motivate and engage them. Thank you. Shameless plug. Uh, so uh, once again, um, I'd like you to, with the people around you, um, discuss and uh, think about the stuff that Pete shared with us. Think about what you can take from that and apply in what you're doing in, in your learning design uh, task. So you, again, three minutes for that, please, everybody. OK, everybody, that's uh, your three minutes up. So. Who would like to share an approach that they can uh, take forward from what we've learned from Pete? It sounded like there were lots of ideas there. Are you intimidated by the hat? Is that what it is? <laughs> I'm not actually a real undertaker. It's, it's fine. <laughs> Nobody's actually going to die here. Thank you. There you go. I think one of the key takeaways for me is that it can be simple. It doesn't need to be difficult. It doesn't yeah. need to be expensive. And you can do something at the lowest common denominator and it can still be a game. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't have to be this huge kind of overarching strategy complicated thing. It's, well, as Pete shared with his business card, really beautiful, simple example that you show it to somebody. It's like, yeah, I get that. You know, you see how that works. Yeah. Here you go. It's a, bit a combination for the both of, the, uh, of you. Um, how do I stop myself as a developer? Because, you know, when I'm thinking about gamification, of course, I'm using badges and I'm using levels and all those, but I want to do more and I want to explore f also for me that oh. the learning experience for me stays, uh, you know, on a higher level. But where, is it, where do I say, well, this is, this is, you stop here? Because you can make it very complex and, um, do you use tools for that? Do you have people around you who say, no, this was not what we agreed to stop here? <laughs> because how do, I, how do I do that? Well, for gamification, it's really easy. You just play test. Yeah, you just try it out because the first six times it's not actually going to be fun. Mm. Yeah, so <laughs> game design is actually not that easy. Mm, no, no. Especially to engage lots of different people. But play testing is quite easy. <coughs> and it's actually all you need to do to improve it. Do you want to just give us an example of playtesting, just so people understand exactly what you mean, Pete? So, say for instance, you're even mocking out a, a video game. You might still cut bits out of bits of paper and sit around the table four or five of you and try and play stuff, play, play it through, see uh -huh. what happens, see about the interactions, does the story work, all that sort of thing. You just keep it as basic as possible without even thinking about how you're actually going to deliver the end result and see if it's fun. Yeah, very good. So, kind of in our language, those are rapid prototypes, stuff that you can put together and use quickly. Fantastic. Thank you, Pete. Thank you for your contributions. Uh, so, Julian. Okay, it's almost like the last 10 minutes of the conference. Dangerous time. Uh, speaking of which, I'm horribly jet lagged, which is very risky. I've drunk a lot of coffee. Would you like the safe presentation or the provocative presentation? <laughs> provocative. Okay, in your heads be it. So. Um, 
Instructional design is not complicated. Um, it's about stopping doing the stuff that's shit and doing the stuff that's really good. And most organizations sort of default to the former because they do design by committee. And the reason we have lots of compliance training that's rubbish isn't because compliance training is inherently rubbish. It's because people who are as good as us ended up designing and delivering compliance training that was rubbish because the systems of the organization forced them into doing that. It's written by committee, it's designed by committee, and somebody's under the false impression that making people spend an hour do it will make them compliant. But of course, people subvert compliance because we're extremely good at it. So yesterday, as I was leaving, uh, I went to go into the lift. There were three people left on the floor here, and I stepped over the rope barrier. And I got berated by the lift attendant for stepping over the rope barrier. Fortunately, we have an undertaker on hand had I killed myself whilst doing it. But the point is, I'm a grown-up, I'm not stupid, I can figure stuff out. So, um, there we are, that's all I've got to say about compliance training. Well, thanks very much. There we are. So, social learning is quite simple. We have formal learning. Formal learning is the story crafted and told by the organisation and done to people. Social learning is the way the real world works, where we figure out what to do. And we do that by talking to each other, by building communities and networks about us of people who we trust. And the people we trust are the people who earn our trust. Because trust, interestingly, isn't in your job title, it's not bestowed on you by the organisation, it's earned through your actions over time within communities. And these communities, of course, some are social, some are formal, but none, crucially, are owned by the organisation. Sure, the organisation may provide some technology where those communities live for a while, but the value of the community is held between individuals. So social learning, in simple terms, takes the formal story, takes the sense-making, collaborative functions of the community around it, and puts it together. So when we approach social learning, we try to do the best of both. The best of the formal organisational story that we already have, the best of what we do already, but also the best of the social learning, the best of that community-moderated, socially held, tacit tribal knowledge that sits around it. So when we come to design social learning, what do we need to do? Well, crucially, we need to not just accidentally design more formal learning. So we need to find ways of crafting formal elements and social elements in between them. So we think the formal elements are the bit that we still want to tell, the bit that we want to say of the formal story. Then we create these bubbles, these spaces for co-creation. And there's something really crucial we have to do in this space, because the word co-creation involves the word co, which means it's our story, it's not my story. So the one thing the organisation has to do to be successful to adopt social learning is to be willing to relinquish control of the story. And when the story that's co-written turns out to be not what the organisation wanted, the crucial thing is not to berate people and beat them with a shoe because they said the wrong thing. It's to accept the fact that maybe the people you hired to do the job know what they're talking about. So in a social learning model, we adapt and iterate every time. We create spaces, we create frameworks, and we co-create and co-write the story within it. So instead of writing a course and believing somehow that it's going to be valid for six years and is going to be delivered time and time again, we rewrite it and iterate it each time, building the tacit and tribal knowledge as we do so, and evolving the formal organisational story. So what does that mean? It means that every learning journey is different, but that's kind of okay because we're all different too. And we just need to be able to perform because really that's what learning's about. It's about helping people to be excellent, not assuming that people are idiots. So social learning approaches give everybody a kind of individualised learning experience, but within a framework. It's within a framework that the organisation can set. So in practice, what does it mean? Well, it means we use different types of activities. And you know, I've got articles online behind all of these slides. So if you're interested in, in, in looking at any of this stuff, um, you can, I'm not hard to find online. Um, so it's about curation activities. It's about interpretation, crucially. You know, it's about the sense-making function of the community, by which I mean, where are you going to go for dinner tonight? You give me a tip, I'll give you a tip. We share some knowledge. You know, it's, communities help us make sense of stuff. 
It's the crucial function of communities. And crucially, without communities, you can't carry out that sense-making function. And without communities that are equal, you can't do that, which is another reason, you know, among many, why organizations need to promote equality and diversity, because if we don't include everybody in our communities, if we don't include all the voices, how can we hope to have that sense-making about us? Because what we don't need is 100 people that think the same as us. We need 99 other people that think subtly differently about the things that we think about. So co-creation is about giving a tempo to the learning. It's about finding um, shared vision and values, about reflective spaces. So in those bubbles that sit around the formal learning, we give people the space to explore ideas and to share what they think about it. But then we need to think about how we capture it. So we have a narrative framework. The formal organizational story gives the narrative framework. We're going to explore the topic of leadership. Individual voices then come in to give their definition and their views of it. And together, we write the story, partly by the organization, partly by the community, about what leadership means to that cohort at that time. And then the next group that goes through has the same formal organizational knowledge, draws in the wisdom of the communities and cohorts that went before it, and then writes their own story. And you can apply that to any subject, even compliance training, to tie into that knowledge within the community. So the question for the organization is not what system can we buy to do social learning, it's are we anchored to the past, to the old models of learning and development, which frankly didn't do all that much, or to the ways of learning we see in the world around us today, more social models of learning facilitated by technology, but empowered by community and utilizing the sense-making function of those communities. And we use stories throughout this piece. Just think about three levels of narrative. Personal stories are what we should all be building over time, our personal narrative of learning and change. What am I doing? Why am I doing that? What have I learned at the moment? What am I going to try next week? Personal stories of learning over time. Co-created stories are the ones we write within our communities. And as instructional designers designing social learning, we can engineer that into our programs, actually writing and publishing those personal stories, the co-created group stories, capturing it, feeding it back into the formal knowledge of the organization. But the interesting one is the organizational story. So instead of the organization thinking it owns the story and doing it to people, in a social learning model, Individuals write stories, groups write stories, and the organizational story becomes a sort of meta-analysis of that. So the organization learns from individuals the same as individuals learn from each other and from the organization. So I've got some books around this stuff. If you're interested in any of this stuff, just ask and you're welcome to have a look at it. Um, coffee has run out. So that's my... I've lost track of time, but I think that's my, uh, yeah, that's my piece on... Social learning. Thank you, Jeannie. Okay, great. So we're on our third cycle of uh, rinse and repeat. So again, think about what Julian has shared with us about storytelling and social and collaborative form of learning. Learning, uh, discuss with the people around you, and then we'll have some final kind of sharing back, and then we'll open it out for questions to the panel. So off you go. Three minutes again. Thank you. Okay, time's up, everybody. Thanks very much. So, any um, great thoughts, ideas for taking forward forms of storytelling and social collaborative learning in your projects, in your work? Hi, I'm Craig. Uh, he'll turn it up. Hi, I'm Craig. Um, we made the point around absolutely have to do it, but how do we not cramp the style of the organization because it's happening already? So how do we get in there without ruining the street cred of the cool kids that are doing it already? <laughs> yeah, I think that's um, right. So, of course, social learning is happening in organizations. Um, the mistake organizations make is to think they can control and own the space. Because uh, if we try to control and own the space, we simply make it a formal space and all the good conversations go elsewhere. So we can start by thinking about how you form the foundations of social learning, so building social capital uh, within individuals, within leadership, within the organization. So you need a space, for sure, uh, but you also need the permissions. So think in those two terms. What spaces have we got? What permissions do we give? And how do we, for example, create the rules? You can co-create the rules on the space. I often say to organizations that 
you know, many of the organizations we work in are geared up to avoid risk. So they're very good at identifying risk, and they're very good at mitigating risk. The fuel and fire of social learning for organizations that truly wish to be here in five years' time is to understand how to take some of that risk on and use it to fuel the learning and fuel the change. Thank you. Any more ideas, comments? Hi, I'm Chris. Um, is, there a, is there a fear of being overly social in the sense that people can share too much? And I, I'll give you an example. Like, say someone does a, um, a sort of a, a handout that might get replicated 20 or 30 times in an org a large organization because people don't always check what's around. Mm -hmm. And so you get wasted kind of time there where people are just... Maybe. I mean, this was kind of the argument from the publishers. When self-publishing came along, all the publishers... Anybody from Wiley here? Anybody from the publishers? No, no, no. Don't know how fast I have to duck. All the publishers said, oh, it's self-publishing. You'll get a million pieces of crap published. And they were absolutely right. You know, a load of absolute rubbish got published. And then the community came along and sorted it for us. And they said, this is what you should read. This is what you should watch. So, you know, it's community-moderated sense-making. So, for sure, people will share a ton of stuff, and a ton of stuff will be wrong. And then a ton of people in the new community will say, hey, that's wrong. And if you get your collaborative bit right, they'll say, I'll fix it for you. So it's trusting people to do that? Trust the same things we do every day to each other. You know, people are good with people. So the mistake is to think that formal learning is real and that social learning is something new. We're all really good at social learning because we used to get eaten by wolves if we weren't. And then we came along and we imposed this model of formal learning and then convinced ourselves that it was right. But actually, what we're seeing now is the technology has got to a space where social behaviors are... Um, exerting themselves over formal systems. So I always say, you know, formal authority can never fully subvert social authority. While well, social authority can always fully subvert formal authority. So all we're doing is tying into the underlying sociology, the sort of natural dynamics that exist within communities. Fantastic. Well, let's open it up now for um, questions to any of the panel. Um, so this doesn't just have to be about social and storytelling and so forth. And anything that you'd like to explore, any comments or thoughts? Um, can you think of an example which blends all three of your perspectives? I think so. I would say something like GIFGAF. Has anyone come across GIFGAF? Hmm. And how they manage their community. They, they use gamification to help motivate people to put in better quality answers, more answers. Into, so that they don't actually have a customer service centre, so the community answers everything. I think it's quite the opposite. I haven't got an opinion on that one, but I think it probably does all three things. Yeah, I mean, most organisations I see tackle parts of it. So the, the primary responsibility of the organisation is to get out of the way of people learning. The mistake that was made was organisations would look at all the great learning and development money they were spending, look at some people who are superb in the organisation and pat themselves on the back because they made those people superb. Whilst actually a lot of people are really good despite everything the organisation does to them to prevent them being good. <laughs> so the best organisations are the ones that open up spaces and give permission and then work with those communities to, uh, to look at what comes out of it and do something with it, to, you know, to trust in their own people. And, and incidentally, that's key, because if you talk about the number one challenge most organizations face is retention. And the reason they face retention challenges is because they're not great places to work. And those organizations that crack it and give people space to invest themselves in the organization will reap the reward of keeping the best people. Great. Um, I work for an organization that is um, incredibly risk averse. Um, and it's so risk averse that the people themselves have completely embedded that. We've got lots of people who have been working there for 20, 30, 40, even 50 years. Um, and so a lot of what you're saying kind of necessitates someone to get involved, someone to give an opinion, someone to want to play the game, someone to want to test the game. Um, and what we're trying to do is kind of enable more social things and just not, not create informal places, but kind of just nudging and prompting and kind of opening it up, but we have people, it's so embedded in our culture that it's really hard to get. So I guess the question is, how do you motivate people to kind of have the confidence to want to give an opinion or get involved or play a game? That makes sense? It, it does, but I mean, the, the, the key question is not how you get people to do it. The key question for the organization to understand is the cost of not doing it. Mm. So in the social age, we see a space where 
organizational models overall are failing. And when they fail, they fail fast. So you look at how the music industry, the entertainment industry, the car industry could be on the edge of it, the mobile phone industry, they're all being broken by sudden changes in the way we as consumers want to interact with services and products. Mm -hmm. Because I work for the government, um, it's a bit harder for us to fail, if that makes sense, because there isn't the kind of competitive edge to um, try and be the best because you kind of always have to be there because the bins always have to be collected. And I know that... Yeah, so, it's I mean, you know, you say that, but I can already be a digital citizen of Estonia. I can be a digital citizen <laughs> of Paris, you know, and we'll see the space where people will be a digital citizen of Apple. You know, mm -hmm. soon we'll be driving Apple cars and we'll have our Apple watches. So just because things are how they are doesn't mean they'll always be how they, you know, how they will be. Mm. You're right, of course, you know, it is hard to take those steps. Um, but it's about the viability of the organization. Uh, many of the existing functions of most of the organizations that we work for or with are mechanisms of control over individual. And they're based on an old social contract, which was, you give me your trust and loyalty and bend your will to mine, and I'll give you a career. And that's a fiction. You know, somebody who's 18 in the UK today will have 28 different jobs before whatever passes for retirement. In the US, it's something like 42 different jobs. So nobody buys into that. Any more questions, thoughts, observations? I could expand on, on that as well. I think that it's, um, if we do have people that are sticking points, sometimes we need to take what we're doing to them and find what is the thing that actually does fire them up if we're really struggling to get them fired up. What do they do when they go home on the weekend? What's the thing that actually gets them going there? And how can we work on that and translate that back into their processes? in the workplace as well. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. So before we... Uh, there's a couple of little things just to cover off before we wrap up. So, I mean, mostly, just to check. Ed, are you, are you still feeling like this? Are you, is anybody else now feeling like this that wasn't feeling like this? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a great um, thing to continue with, but not to dismiss the ideas coming from. Yeah, yeah. It's a shame, instructional designs. He's got such a stupid name, hasn't he? It means nothing. <laughs> Um, uh, so, brilliant. I mean, it's, it, we've been here to pay our respects and to say goodbye, and it could, be a, could have been a sombre event, but I think it was really positive, and it was great to have you all involved. It's great to shape, you know, young, sprightly, uh, lovely, learning experience design. And the, the final thing, really, just to say is that, um, you know, funerals, we tend to think of them as sombre occasions. In other countries, they're, they're less sombre. So, um, check this out. This is a, a funeral in New Orleans. And uh, this is for a, uh, a jazz player. Have the audio up, please. Uh, I don't think so. Oh, the music's great. <laughs> it's really good, I'll hum it. But no, just, ch you know, particularly, check out this lady here. Check this out. So that, I feel, is how we are celebrating the life, saying goodbye to instructional design and celebrating the new life. <laughs> She's got the moves, hasn't she? The music's great as well. It's only... Do you, do you want me to persevere and see if I can get the music on? All right, okay. Let's see what I can do. Right. Tell you what. Let's do it from here instead. No, that's up. It's up. It's not muted. It played earlier. Oh. The bat, uh, here we are. It's got the moves, look at that. This, this guy's really cool as well, I like his hat. So
So, well, thank you everybody for your contributions. Thank you for being a part of uh, the session today. Uh, I hope you've had a great conference. Uh, maybe see you outside for drinks in a bit. And thank you to our three wonderful speakers. Thank you.